Hi everybody, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel, and today I would like to talk to you about overcoming artistic block. Okay, something that stumps every creative person from every different walk of life, be you, uh, you know, uh, a visual painter, be you a cinematographer, be you a writer, be you a singer, whatever the case might be. Anybody who has to make up crazy shit from the top of their head and do this on a regular basis can get stumped. All right. However, oh, this is something that used to plague me all the time earlier on in my career, but as I've gained experience, I've learned different ways of overcoming that quickly. Number one, stay productive. Okay. If you compare it to a video game, let's say I take a game like, like The Witcher or World of Warcraft. I just started playing The Witcher recently, so, uh, so I'm kind of more in that kind of headspace. If you just sit down and play for five minutes, you haven't had a chance to get caught up in the narrative. You haven't gotten the chance to, to get, you know, to, you know, to rack up quests and get caught up in the, in the whole, in the lore and the environment and stuff like that. You don't, you haven't necessarily created a strong connection with it. So you play for five minutes and eh, bored and you close it. Okay. But if you've been playing a lot, if, if there are, if you, you, when you play a lot, you start to set up goals, you start to set up, you know, you start to get more immersed in the world of your art. You're constantly thinking about it. It's always on your on your mind. When you go and grab something to eat, you're thinking about what you're going to be doing next with your painting or what kind of thing you're going to be painting next. You start getting yourself caught up in the world of your own creations. And that's a very good way to keep yourself moving forward. However, if you take a break from it, let's say you're really into it, you know, like World of Warcraft, for instance, because, you know, pretty much any you know living breathing human being can relate to this game um you're questing you're chasing after that next piece of tier gear you want to down this boss blah 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 blah. okay you've gotten yourself caught up in that in that that chase in that goal that keeps you coming back to play more and more and more right you you're thinking about it when you go off and you're doing other things you're thinking about when i get back i want to do this but let's say you get bored of it so you put the game down for a little while and you don't play for a couple of weeks when you come back for at least the the first little while you might turn it on and go I don't know what to do and you turn it off you just get bored of it and you let it go well the same thing can it can apply to your own life your own creative process as an artist if you step away from it for too long then when you get back it's kind of like you know, turning a game back on and going, okay, well, what do I do next, right? You don't know. <laughs> so you try, you draw a little bit, you, you, you fiddle around with it for a little bit, and then you drop it and you don't get anything done, okay? This happens. So one of the tricks is do make an effort to produce something every day or do something art-related or do something creative-related. When I teach, you know, very often, I, you know, I, I teach full-time, whether it be online or in, in the school, there can be days where I don't necessarily get to sit down and draw because I'm busy teaching, right? But because I'm teaching art, I'm still connected with the art world. I'm still sitting down and demonstrating certain things for my students. We're still talking art. We're still keeping ourselves in the creative in the creative spirit. So my brain is there and I am growing. As a teacher, one of the best ways to, to learn is to teach, right? So as I'm teaching, I'm also constantly revisiting the basics right? Which is something that every artist of every different level needs to do. You constantly have to bring yourself back to the basics all the time. You know, clean up your work method. Don't get too caught up in trivialities. Keep it clean and simple, okay? And that's something that, teach, something that teaching does for me on a regular basis. So remember that. Keep your, try to keep yourself immersed. However, what happens if life happens? Maybe you just have priorities. Maybe it's tax season. Maybe, you know, and you have to spend two, three days doing your taxes. Maybe, you know, something happens to a friend or a, pe or, or a member of your family and you have to tend to that, right? Something that's just something that's unavoidable, right? If that happens and you haven't, you, let's say one or two weeks pass and you haven't had a chance to do anything and you come back to it, one of the most detrimental things to your to your sense of productivity, to getting back on the wagon, getting back into the flow, is being too hard on yourself. Stephen Silver actually had a really good talk about this recently, uh, talking about the guilt of not painting, right? Very good talk. And 
something else a friend of mine said, a fellow artist, he's actually an animator, um, and he trains at the same gym I do. His name is Javier. And whenever we go to the gym, where we, we, we end up spending like two hours chatting, you know? We talk a lot because we're both artists, right? So we end up, you know, yapping forever. And he said something in context of something completely unart related at that particular point, but it was something that he said that really stuck with me and resonated with me. I was, I was being hard on myself about something else. I can't remember what it was. And he said, have compassion for yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. And I went, hmm, that's, that kind of, that's, that's very meaningful, actually. That's very often when we're very ambitious people we you know as artists we're always looking for growth we're always looking to go somewhere very often we have a tendency to get really hard on ourselves if we don't and if we don't produce anything then we get pissy we get moody we get hard on ourselves when you put yourself in that headspace when you start getting too negative on yourself that is a very good buzzkill okay that's a very good way of keeping yourself from being productive it's kind of like yeah you know, it's kind of like you know um trying to make a relationship work by forcing somebody to be nice, you know, be nice, be kind, be friendly, be happy. If somebody told you to be happy forcefully every day, probably that'd probably be the last thing on your mind. It would probably be make, probably make it very difficult for you to be happy, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm happy. Fuck off. <laughs> you know, let me, let, let it come to me naturally. So when you find yourself in that headspace, have compassion for yourself. Okay. I took a couple of weeks off. So be it. I'm coming back to it. Let's get, let's give myself a chance to get back into the flow. Okay. So remember to have compassion for yourself. Now you've taken your break. You've had some time off. You've, you decided you were going to take a week off and go on a video game, you know, a video game blitz for two weeks and abandon your life because you had a bit of free time. It's your summer vacation. That's what you decided to do for yourself or you went camping for two weeks or whatever the case might be. And you come back and you're sitting down and you've decided it's time to start painting again. But nothing's coming to you, okay? Nothing's coming to you. You don't feel like you can get back in the flow. You spent like three, four hours and you're trying to paint and nothing's happening, okay? Trick number one. Trick number one is learn something new. As artists, in order to stay stimulated, in order to stay productive, we need to feel a sense of accomplishment. Accomplishment plays a huge role in inspiration. Think about all of the pieces of artwork that you've produced that you that have the most most meaning to you on a personal level. And I can pretty much guarantee you, I'm willing to place a bet on the fact that the reason this painting, although it might not have been your most popular publicly, holds a lot the most meaning to you is because chances are you learn something very, very valuable from it. Maybe you had one of those, one of those, uh, 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 one of those epiphanies, right? Where you went, oh, all of a sudden something clicked. Remember if you've seen one of my old, if you've seen one of my earlier, uh, um, talks where I'm talking about the artistic learning curve, right? Every now and then you're, you know, a lot of people think the artistic learning curve is like this when in fact it's more like this, right? You get these aha moments, right? Well, Maybe you had one of those one of those big artistic learning learning jolts. You had a big epiphany in your in your artistic growth. That growth, that learning, that that something that clicked, introducing something new into your artwork is what made it so inspiring. All of a sudden that feeling that you can accomplish something you couldn't accomplish before. Okay? So if one of the things that I make a regular, a very regular habit of doing is constantly, constantly keeping my eyes out for something to learn from or something to inspire me from. However, I don't limit myself to art itself. One of, funny enough, one of the, the last places I look for inspiration is other artists. Because it doesn't necessarily teach me something about myself, about my own art. It teaches me about other people's art. I generally have a tendency to look at other people's art when I'm thinking in terms of quality. What's the bar that this art, that this studio is setting? What's the bar that this artist has set? And I look to set that same bar with my own artwork, okay? And raise the bar every single time I do something else. But that's not necessarily teaching me something new that I can apply to my own art. If I'm only looking at art 
it's a very limited range of inspiration. Art in and of itself is one thing, but the world is very vast. It's, it's huge. There are so many things to learn from, so many different walks of life to learn from that, that can contribute so much more to your artistic growth. I mentioned this in one of my earlier talks, and I think I might have mentioned it during one of my gumroads, I'm not sure, where um, I was sitting down watching my daughter getting, getting her, her hair cut by a good friend of mine who's an, an absolutely amazing hairdresser and esthetician. And because I was sitting there, you know, I was sitting there bored, I wasn't doing anything, I, I started to ask her about aesthetics, about hairdressing, and where she learned and stuff like that, just out of curiosity. And she reached out, pulled out this huge book and dropped it on my lap, a book like, like you know, <laughs> a big fat book. She almost crushed my knees, you know. And I started flipping through it and all of a sudden I'm sitting there going, oh my God, a whole different way of looking at, of hairstyles and how they balance with the body. Or balance with different different face shapes that go with different type of hairstyles and different type of fashion, different type of clothes that go with different types of hair that go with different types of faces. And there was this that I realized that aesthetics and hairdressing and all of these different things are all about balance, how to balance the human form, because it essentially is the study of the human form. It had a different take on human anatomy. It had a different take on on the appearance of the human face from a very, very in-depth perspective it was something that that i got a lot from so i ended up you know borrowing her book for a couple of weeks and i went down to the cafe and i was reading through it you know a lot of people sitting there looking at the six foot three guy you know sitting there like this with his book and his coffee reading you know about makeup <laughs> but it was amazingly valuable to me and it's it's amazing how much it contributed to my to my character design okay you know asking an electrician how he does his job asking a a a, a uh, a dishwasher repairman how he has how he does his job a lawyer quantum physics god you want to get inspired look at quantum physics i'm always always i i i rarely watch movies i'm always watching documentaries there's the whole on netflix i've been watching a lot of the um the uh, the life and uh planet earth planet earth planet earth documentaries and stuff like that god they're gorgeous and they're narrated by David Attenborough, who's, you know, like the uncle I never had. So it's, they're absolutely wonderful. Endless sources of inspiration. They're constantly connecting you to different species, to different environments, to different climates. It talks about different climates, right? The plains, mountainous regions, the oceans, the polar ice caps, right? Um, all of these different things. So it's constantly feeding your inspiration. It's constantly giving you new material and giving you an opportunity to grow and see the world from a different angle. And that's where growth and learning really comes from. All right. So remember, rule number one, always learn something new. If you're, if you're constantly redoing, rehashing the same thing over and over again, because there's no growth, you're not going to get the same level of satisfaction and stimulation and learning from that particular type of artwork over and over and over again. Now, don't confuse this with one, one of the things I mentioned in an earlier talk about a professional versus a personal portfolio. I'm not saying don't repeat the same technique, okay? Or build on an existing technique, something that's repeatable for the sake of working professionally, okay? You're repeating the same technique, but every single time you do, you're bringing in new knowledge and new inspiration into it. So essentially that toolkit, that professional toolkit that you're going to be using to apply to different clients and studios, that professional toolkit that you're building for yourself, that product of yours that you're building, okay, it's not just going to stay a little block of granite forever. It's going to grow. It's going to get better and better and better and better. And eventually that toolkit that you have, that formula that you've created is becoming is going to become something very grand. But that that skill that you have needs to continue to expand and get bigger and better. And in that same period of time that it would take you to do one piece of art, you end up finding yourself doing something 20 times better following that same process or building on that process and making that process more complex, injecting more knowledge and experience into that. Okay, That's the essence of, of that type of thing. The next is change your angle. Okay. That's a huge, huge way of overcoming block. Even if you're immersed in your artwork and you're constantly productive and all of these different things, even in 
when you're in the flow, something can just, you know, the weather changes. And all of a sudden you wake up and your head's not there. Maybe you're a little bit tired. Maybe you're, you've been a bit overworked. You've been doing too much and your, your brain's just exhausted and you, you're having a hard time moving forward. One of the things that makes artwork exhausting and prevents you from being able to get inspired and, and move forward with your artwork is that you're constantly approaching your artwork from the same angle, from the same vantage point. And that can get very boring at a certain point. All right. So one of the tricks I've learned is when I find you can feel it's something you can feel with your body when you can feel in your brain and your body that you're not getting there today. It might be because you're fo you're only focused on one particular thing. And that thing that most of us generally tend to focus on is the physical generic aesthetics of my artwork. Today, I've decided that I'm going to paint a hunter in the woods tracking blah, 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 blah. And uh, the idea in my ha I have in my head is that he's going to be kneeling by a camp. I recently extinguished campfire and there's going to be that the, the coals are still smoldering. So they probably saw him coming and blew it out and took off. Right. So he's he notices the smoke and he's, you know, kind of like the Witcher. Right. Because I've been playing that recently. So um, kind of like that type of idea where he, he he's kind of scanning the environment and searching for clues to figure out what was going on in the scene you know like aragorn from uh, uh from lord of the rings when he's looking through the the scene where the where the urukai were were slaughtered right and he's trying to track what happened to frodo and pip or from mary and pip that type of idea so that's the that's the idea in my head but that idea is just a generic idea so when i'm thinking generically i'm going to think okay how am i going to pose this character and what kind of an environment is he in well he's going to be in the woods and he's going to be kneeling down next to the campfire looking at the campfire and he's going to be wearing you know leather outfit and two swords because i like thinking up very original ideas and not rip off anything from very very popular video games so he's got two swords and he's got white hair and a ponytail and he's a witch hunter or something like that i'm trying to think of something original but i digress i'm thinking generically i'm thinking of I'm thinking of symbolism, the symbol of what a hunter is, the symbol of what the environment's looking like, the symbol of what this narrative is about. But I'm very much only grazing the surface of what this can really be. And I start to paint it, and it's, ugh, it's not, it's not, I'm not particularly happy. It's not, it's not working out to my liking. Okay. And I'm working on it, and I'm starting to feel like I'm getting into this repair mode, trying to fix something that was kind of already a piece of shit at the beginning, and uh, and and it's just not coming out. And what do you do? Well, at that particular point, when I find myself in that headspace, chances are, it means that I'm not I'm not taking, I, or at least I need to switch my perspective. So what I might do is, instead of just thinking of the aesthetics, I start to think of the narrative, okay? I start to think of what's the story of this piece? What's the story of my character? Who is he? Is he just some generic Hunter 227B? Or is he, uh, or is he somebody who comes from somewhere who has a per certain type of personality? Okay, when you think that way, I'll think, okay, if I, I'll just take Witcher, just so I'm, I'm too lazy to think of my own original narrative. He's, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a trained, you know, the narrative behind him is that he's, I, I never played Witcher 1 or 2, so I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't know the backstory to him, but just as far as he's introduced in Witcher 3, he's, you know, he's, um, he's a sword for hire, extremely well trained uh, 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 fighter who, who travels around looking for looking for things to fix a fixer upper right and he's got these types of powers and these types of powers and these are his values and this is the type of personality he's a little rough around the edges he's not mr nice guy who goes don't worry i made it i will help you ha <laughs> ha no he's you know he'll do it he'll do it for a bounty he's except for people he cares about right if there's somebody he cares about okay so we're starting to get into his compa okay he's got a bit of a compassionate side he's a bit of a playboy he's a bit like this he's a bit like that i'm starting to build more of a narrative around him what does that do okay well if i stick him in this environment it's not just a generic forest he's got a relationship with that forest this is his home this is where he's most comfortable he smells bad because he's been picking these these types of herbs that stink like rotting corpses and he's perfectly comfortable with that and and he's you know dirty and sweaty and he's covered in blood and you know that kind of thing 
He's, he's in his element. Okay, so there's a comfort between him and his environment. Furthermore, the things he looks for, the things he, the things he pays attention to are very specific. He's not just posing by a campfire, right? How does he... How does he make physical contact with the ground? Well, if he was somebody who was noble, he would go down and put his sword down and he would kneel, he would, he would put his hand on his knee and crouch because he doesn't want to get his, his, his mitten dirty, his, his clean uh, white mitten. He does not want to get them dirty, right? But as a tracker, he'll put his hands right up against the ground. He'll feel the dirt. He'll, he'll look closely at herbs. He'll have a very, very intimate connection with the environment that he's in, right? He's... But because he's trained, he's not going to run through the forest with bravado and carelessness. No, he understands that when he's in the environment, he is prey. He, there's no, you know, ravenous animals don't make any distinction between him and, and, you know, a fox. He's food. So kill him, right? So he's not going to just run into danger without thinking about it. He has to be very careful. He has to use his senses. Now we're starting to build a lot of narrative around him. When you start to build narrative around him, it starts to solve questions like, how is he dressed? Why does he dress this way? What kind of stuff does he have to, what kind of gear does he need to have, right? He travels on his own. How long is he on his own? How far away is he from home, right? Uh, that type of thing. So you got to think, okay, well, if he's traveling on his own, he has to have this type of gear. He has to carry these types of weapons. He has to wear this type of material. It's, he's not going to be wearing full plate. He's a hunter. He's rolling in the dirt. He needs to wear leather, something that's supple. That leather that he's wearing has got to be really worn down and dirty, okay? It's not clean, pristine, reddish brown. It's going to be desaturated brown gray, right? Because it's been rubbing in the dirt a lot. There's blood stains on it. We're injecting a lot of narrative into this character, Look at how stimulated I'm getting just talking about it. This is generating a lot of ideas. How is he going to place himself in the environment? Okay, he's tracking, but is he is he tracking? Is he did he just walk? Oh, look at that campfire! <laughs> you know, no, he's not going to do that. He he might scan it from a distance. Okay, well maybe I'll place him here behind this bush, you know, or maybe I'll place him over here. Maybe I'll hide him behind the tent. Maybe there's a couple of bad guys and they're stand, standing around the campfire talking to each other, and he's sneaking in for a sneak attack or something like that. Okay, you can think the narrative will stimulate you and get you immersed. Furthermore, as you're doing this, you're thinking, oh crap. Okay, well now I need to know how to paint a campfire. Now I need to, what do these tents look like? So you start looking up Im specific image references to go with that particular narrative. And when you look at that image reference, you start to find, oh, well, he has a sword up here and the grindstone over there and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden you start to, you start to, you start to get more into the design headspace, all of these different elements that I can inject into the piece to push the narrative. All right. Another angle you can take is the emotional side of it. Okay. Sometimes the narrative, you've exsanguinated the narrative to the, to the best of your abilities and you're just, <clears throat> you know, it's just not getting out there. I very often, what I do for a lot, especially for my character designs, is I start to think about the emotion behind this character. Am I just doing a graphic design of a humanoid figure who's, who looks like this? No, I want to think of this character's emotional connection to this environment. In fact, emotion is one of the most powerful tools to creating a strong visual a strong emotional impact with your audience. There's a very big difference between a tracker who is <laughs> smelling a campfire and somebody who's, who's, who came in to check the campfire and then heard something. Now there's an emotional reaction. So now he's at the alert. What kind of a character is he? When he's at the alert, is he, a tr is he kind of like a cool guy who, who makes slow movements because he doesn't want to attract attention to himself? So he looks over, or maybe his ear, he hears something with his ears and he peeks over at the side. Or is he more like a, like a, is he, was he like Tarzan who was raised by the animals who goes, oh, you know, something a little bit more comical or something a little bit more like a wildling type of thing, right? People who are, who are, who are raised by, you know, raised by wolves or bears, whatever the case might be. So the emotional side of your character can help place him and give him a physical and an emotional connection to his environment and that can play that can bounce back and forth the environment will help push the design and the narrative of your character and the character can help push the design of the environment you're setting everything up so that when people look at it they immediately get who your character is 
what their role is, how they interact with this particular environment and how they feel. If you can capture feeling in emotion, a feeling in a, in a piece of artwork, that's what's going to make your piece of artwork memorable. Em emotion is what makes something memorable. Remember the old quote, nobody will ever remember what you say, but they'll always remember how you made them feel, right? If you think of any piece of artwork that really had a lasting impact, something that stuck in your brain, chances are there was an emotional connection to it, right? Not just aesthetics, but emotion. You're thinking of a dragon walking over a rock, stepping into the light, right? Is it the fact that it was beautifully painted that made you remember it? No, it was the beautiful artwork that made you admire it. But what made you remember it was the fact that it had this very magical, ethereal feel to it. You felt like you were in this enchanted forest and the lighting was magical and the dragon was magical and the rocks were magic. It was a magical emotion. It was a very fantastical. You felt the glow. You felt all the particles, all the pollen that was floating through the air, catching the light in the light beam. That's the kind of stuff that gets you. Okay. If you can take yourself out of the physical, out of the, out, out of the materialistic and get into the emotional, that's one of the best tricks. When I do character designs, very often it's the emotion itself that creates the character. I'm not thinking about, you know, what's this character look like? I don't necessarily come from, sometimes I do, but generally speaking, when I, the, the characters that, the character designs that I create that have the most impact aren't the ones where I went, okay, I want my character to look like that. No, I think about what is the, at the core, what's, what's the core emotion of this particular character? A good example is my, um, is my character Hate, all right? I was thinking about a woman who was, who was, who had the, her, the all of the blood was, like, like all of the hate was bursting into her jaw. I was thinking about the, uh, all I was thinking, I had my eyes closed and I was thinking about this, this emotion of hate, but livid, pure hate in somebody's face and how would that would how that energy would translate through the body well the hate wasn't in the gut the hate was in the face so when i started when i started i started with the face and then i thought of all of that energy that pushed through the body into the face that ended up creating this uh, this this look on her face of of rage in the jaw you know when you're very very angry you get this rage in the uh, like this and it pushed into her eyes and there's this look of just absolute malice and hate in her face and the fist if you look at the actual objects that I painted she has this long white dress if you look at it from a distance it looks elegant and beautiful this long white dress she's hyper tall right it's a long white dress, but the whole reason was I wanted to take all of that line and energy and push it right into the face until she, in holding this umbrella of all things, right? But like this, everything's pushing into this moment and the umbrella helped to extend it. I was painting emotion. The, the, the actual aesthetics, the actual objects that I painted were very secondary, but were there to emphasize this emotion. The other piece that I did of, of Venus, it's a look of trust and love in her face you look at her face and it's a it's a look of i i pictured her having a snarling beast in front of her face this is how i painted her i pictured the snarling beast looking right back at her okay like breathing hot air through these huge nostrils at her face and just having her being like the mother of this creature completely unfazed and unfearful and taming this beast with with love essentially right so have a look and you, you'll be able to see that in her face, a look of re relaxation and compassion in her face. The emotion drove the image. It's what created, it, it's what helped me pick the colors, it's what helped me create the pose, it's what helped me cre create this facial expression, all of these different things, all right? The last but not least is reference and how you use this reference. Very often, the biggest mistake I see people do is that they look up reference in hopes to find inspiration to make a painting. And in fact, that's backwards, okay? I've tried that. I've looked at images and said, okay, I'm gonna do a painting of that. I'm gonna use this of as my base, you know, try maybe doing a little bit of photo bashing or something like that, right? Using that, that, in, that, that image to create my own inspired piece, what ends up happening is I end up plagiarizing that image because 
it's perfect in and of itself. It's all of the elements are in, in place. And the reason I was attracted to it is because I already found that a beautiful image. If I take that and I try to morph it or try something different with it, I end up feeling like I have to stop because I'm not creating anything original. I'm just plagiarizing this, this photograph. So what I do is I start from the narrative. I start from the emotion. I start from the atmosphere. I start from thinking about different things that happened outside of my life different things that inspired me outside of my life and I start to flesh together this idea okay and this idea grows in my head and I start to paint it and at a certain point from a visual perspective I start to get blocked I start to feel the idea is there I love the idea I love where this is going but physically the actual image itself looks very flat and uninteresting to me so what I do is with this narrative in mind I start looking up very specific image references to help me flesh out what all of these different elements are. And in the process of doing that, I also, I am also exposed to the context of that reference. So in my particular piece, I have, you know, like a, it's a circus and there's all kinds of freakish characters, you know, we're kind of, it's like a, it's like a sideshow of freak shows. And I'm thinking about a circus and I'm thinking about, you know, this, midday sunlighting shining down on these characters and I'm, I'm just a I'm just some kind of tourist who's walking by feeling a little bit uncomfortable and as I walk by all of these freaks are just looking at me you know kind of it's making me think about the scene in uh, Shrek uh, Shrek the fourth Shrek where they're driving through the slums which is like witches <laughs> I love this scene so much you know, the, the king and queen at the beginning of the movie are going through the, they're, they're going down a dirt road and it's kind of like, you know, redneck country, you know, there's somebody playing the banjo and there's the witch and she's sitting down on a thing and she's, okay, you know, and then there's this, then there's the, the like the, another witch who's got like white face and he's leaning up against the tree and the king looks at him and he looks at him and he goes, like this and he <laughs> closes the curtain, that kind of thing, you know. You're thinking about that kind of scene and you're drawing it, you're painting it, but uh, I, I, it just looks like shit. I'm painting too much from my head. I'm not using enough reference and these objects are looking very generic. That's when I start looking up. Okay, well, I know in this scene I have tents, but I don't want them to be, in my head, I don't want them to be colorful circus tents. I want them to be desaturated and really worn down like it's kind of like this traveling circus, but the real you know the real slummy traveling circus type of thing and all these people are more like they're they're crossed between being freaks and being just evil people you know so it's very kind of a cob thing so i'm i'm looking up you know uh uh worn fabric i'm looking up uh i'm looking up um circus tents and and traveling sideshows and all of these different things to help generate ideas give me actually show me what a circus like traveling circus tents look like oh maybe i don't want something modern maybe i want something old so i look up pictures from the 1930s and 40s or maybe even back in in the 19th century i start looking at stuff from 1880 and 1890 what was the circus like back then you know looking up some vintage photography that's when i use my image reference i already have the idea i already have the narrative i already know what the emotion of this piece is but i'm just stumped visually i just don't have the right reference to execute this drawing the way i wanted to that's the full package with all of these different angles it might have taken me 30 minutes to explain all to them to you but in your brain all of this stuff is happening happening instantaneously right you're drawing and you just flip your consciousness flip your consciousness from one thing to the other the technique you're using is a very repeatable technique but you're flipping your consciousness to keep that idea moving forward and this is especially effective when you've been out of the loop for a little while, you've taken a little break from it a little while, your brain is a little rusty and you got to get yourself back into it. What you do is you start a project, you think of something, doesn't matter what it is. You know, hunter and forest, cool, good enough. You start to draw it. It's not looking good. Think about the emotion. Ah, okay, he's like this. Think about the narrative. Ah, this is his backstory. This is where he's going. This is who he's going to meet. And before you know it, within five, ten minutes, you start fleshing out this very, very interesting narrative and you're back on track. All right. So there's my little, there's my little bit of a inspiration tip thingy mabob for you today. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, remember, if you're interested in a mentorship, it's a first come first serve uh, type of system. 
uh, Lucid Pixel, but you can feel free to get in contact with me. All of the contact information is in the link in the description. Remember to like and subscribe if you want to keep promoting the channel. Remember to spread the word. And um, yeah, so hopefully you, you got a little bit of something to help you get those creative juices flowing. And of course, if you have any questions that you would like answered in my following Q&A, just leave comments in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the video itself. All right. Happy painting, everybody. Take care.